fantastic turnout. Um, probably a, um, one of our record turnouts actually is complete an utter set out um, with, with a waiting list. Um, and I'm, I'm really thankful to, uh, to the response from Madrid to London, right through to our uh, various extended boundaries in the UK and Spain. And it's great to see you all. I can, I can recognize quite a few of you actually. Um, I will um, be sort of nominally chairing this evening. Um, we've got sort of three fantastic uh, speakers and panelists. Um, um, before I, I go into the sort of heart of the matter, um, I wanted just to uh, tell you a sort of good news, which is, um, and I'm sure I'll remind you at the end of this, but in case any of you um, skive off, which I doubt very much um, before the end, because you've got screaming children or your baia is overcooking or whatever. Um, the um, Bloomsbury, which uh, the publishers of uh, Giles's book, uh, has very kindly agreed to a, a 20 percent um, uh, discount offer on, on his book, um, which is this massive um, 600 pager, um, which I only just finished uh, about an hour ago. Um, and uh, which which is a great deal, and um, all we you'll you'll need to do if you're interested is I mean tomorrow we'll be sending you emails with a, a special code. Um, I am informed by Bloomsbury uh, that for uh, inverted commas customs problems, um, unfortunately uh, they cannot physically send this book outside the UK or the US. Um, uh, but they can send it outside those two regions by as an ebook. Um, anyway, that will be explained to you. Uh, on the subject of inverted commas customs problems, um, takes me to just alert you and flag up that next Tuesday, March the second, we have Philip Stevens, uh, senior editor at the uh, at the FT, political editor at the FT, um, with Ignacio Torreoranco, probably. Uh, that one of the leading Spanish commentators on European affairs um, discussing uh, from Zuis to Brexit, um, uh, is there a global Britain? Um, not to be missed, so you can diarise that. That's next Tuesday as part of our ongoing webinar series. Um, I wanted to welcome uh, this evening our three um, panellists, uh, all of whom I've known for some time, uh, Richard Baxel, um, who has been himself an author of, of several books on the Spanish Civil War. He's, a, he's an expert on the international brigades. Uh, he's a researcher at the, um, at the London School of Economics um, and knows uh, a lot about this particular subject. He was also uh, chair of the International Brigade Memorial um, Trust, um, uh, which is a, a, a kind of foundation um, set up in memory of, of many of the brigadistas. Um, Paul, Sir Paul uh, Preston needs absolutely no introduction. And it's great to have you back, Paul, uh, so soon after your brilliant um, discussion that you and I had uh, in an earlier webinar. Um, and um, it, it's very generous of you to, to uh, as part of your honorary membership of the, uh, of the British Spanish Society to be, be with us again. Um, Paul obviously has written more about the Spanish Civil War than anyone I know. Um, and last but by no means least, we have Giles Tremlett, um, a journalistic colleague of mine over many years. Uh, he, uh, Guardian's Madrid bureau chief, um, he still is a, an associated contributing editor, <clears throat> and he's the um, author of uh, three uh, very uh, well-admired books um, prior to this one. Uh, one, um, Ghosts of Spain, which became a sort of bestseller, um, which was all about contemporary Spain. Uh, the other two were two whacking big biographies, as big as this one. Uh, one on uh, Isabella, Isabella de, de Castilla, and the other one on... Um, Catherine of uh, Catalina de Aragón. Um, so um, both we we uh, we introduced to the British Spanish Society in conversation with Giles. Um, his latest book um, is the title of this uh, webinar, uh, which is the uh, International Brigades: Fascism, Freedom, and the Spanish Civil War. Uh, before I, I bring them in. 
um, just to, as as way of introduction. Um, I think that um, it's often been argued, uh, and I'm not telling most of you what you already don't already know that the origins of the Spanish the origins of the Spanish Civil War uh, were endemic to Spain. But what actually happened during the Spanish uh, Civil War involved, uh, not to say the least, uh, quite a lot of foreign intervention. Uh, and the whole issue of foreign intervention uh, became one of the cause celebs um, diplomatically, politically, and strategically, um, quite apart from philosophically. Um, and without doubt for a Anglo-Saxon uh, audience, uh, and, and indeed, to, to, to a large extent, a Spanish audience interested in the Spanish Civil War, um, the, the story of the international brigades, um, whichever way one looks at it, um, has stirred the literary imagination and, and, and also historians uh, in a way that probably no other sort of single chapter of, of that conflict has managed to do. Um, you know, if you ask the, your average Brit, who's not a particular um, academic or, or an expert in the thing, uh, you mention the Spanish Civil War, he will say, George Orwell, homage to Catalonia. You ask an American, he'll say Hemingway and for whom the bell tolls. Um, and both of those have got something to do with the international brigades. Uh, the detail of it has obviously been the subject of a lot of controversy, um, which uh, I won't go into here, but suffice it to say that in terms of contrast, one needs to go no further than to quote Dolores Iraburi, uh, the famous Passionaria, delivering her famous uh, farewell speech to the 13,000 brigadistas as they left Barcelona in October um, 1938, uh, in which she um, uh, loudly said in Spanish, you can go with pride, you are history, you are legend, you are the heroic example of the solidarity and the universality of democracy. We will not forget you. And when the olive tree of peace puts forth its leaves entwined with the laurels of the Spanish Republic victory, come back. Uh, in contrast to that, about 23 years later, John Murray in a review of Hugh Thomas's book on the Spanish Civil War wrote a strange and disconcertingly disconcerting medley of adventurers with some few idealists and a large supply of ruffians and criminals that frustrate that frustrated resentful scum that floats on modern political waters. Take that. Um, but as 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 um, Giles says in his intro, separating as a good journalist, he's he says separating truth from wishful thinking and propaganda is probably the greatest challenge for investigating international brigades, and he has spent six years doing exactly that. And um, I have to say, having just finished this, as I said about an hour ago, um, that this is an extraordinary piece of work. Um, as, a, as, a, as a journalist uh, judging another journalist, it, it's just a gripping journalistic narrative. Uh, you feel as if uh, at, at many stages in the book, as if you're actually in the battlefield. I mean, most extraordinary, uh, colorful, but also detailed um, and researched stuff. Uh, one point. Second point, uh, we can go into it, we'll go into this in the discussion. Um, I find it extraordinarily objective and fair uh, for reasons that will probably uh, become clear in the discussion. Um, and thirdly, um, I, I, I take my hat off to him because, um, and also slightly envious, because he managed to to get hold of some rather interesting uh, Soviet files, uh, which became available only six years ago. And that's the, what one calls treasure. Um, you know, if one gets into that sort of stuff, deep stuff that the KGB has sat on for many, many years, suddenly becomes available. Well, that's great. Um, so good on you, mate. Um, so with no, with no further ado, uh, let me um, bring in, um, Giles first, because there will be a conversation between these three, and then there will be plenty of time for Q and A's afterwards. Which, please, as you listen or you get to the Q and A, put your questions into the chat, and I will try and get round to all of them. Okay, um, Giles, can I kick you off? I mean, not kick you off, but kick you in um, with 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 a question and and an intro, but. Um, 
tell me, as someone who's read your other two massive tomes, apart from Ghosts, uh, Ghosts of Spain, um, what is it that takes you from writing a biography of uh, an imperial Catholic monarch of the 15th century, um, a divorced or uh, an abandoned Catholic Spanish uh, English queen, queen uh, of the 16th century, um, to uh, uh, 25,000 volunteers, um, 2,500 of which are British, the rest from uh, an assortment of countries around the world, of which over 50% are communist. Um, why don't you give us five minutes max as a kind of general answer to that, but also tell us about your book. Okay, well, um, first of all, thank you. Thanks to everybody who's here. As you can see, I'm now called Catherine Scott um, because I had to change laptops uh, just about 10 minutes ago. So that name appears on your screen. Well, well, um, uh, so be it. Um, uh, Jimmy, thanks very much for that introduction. I have to say, when I write these books, uh, although I am a, a, a journalist, I don't think of myself as writing journalism uh, in, any, in any way. Um, to me, I'm writing uh, uh, history or about history. And um, uh, while, you know, being a journalist is a very useful thing when it comes to, to writing a narrative, um, um, you know, I try to um, uh, think in those in those terms. It's then up to historians to decide whether I do a good or bad job, but um, um, that's certainly the the intention. Um, you ask why I've gone from fifteenth, uh, sixteenth century Spain to twentieth century Spain. Um, well, partly that's an advantage of not professional historian I guess because you're allowed to to uh, jump around um, uh, the, the time scales and uh, and go to different centuries personally when I'm writing or when I'm thinking of projects I'm really thinking about the things that I want to know about and different ways of uh, 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 of approaching them um, you know the Spanish Civil War has always been fascinating to me. I remember reading Hugh Thomas's book years ago. I remember reading Homage to Catalonia when I was 17 or 18. Um, so um, uh, the International Brigades, in a way, is just a way to approach the Civil War. But also, you know, over the years, I did actually meet quite a few brigaders as they came through came through Madrid. Um, and so that in itself was interesting because they were quite a remarkable bunch. Those who met them, I think, will, uh, uh, will agree with that. Um, but also um, um, always you know, a, a lot of polemic around them about what they were doing, about why they were here. And of course, I'm in Madrid at the moment. Um, you know, I live in a very conservative neighbourhood. Um, if I knocked on the door of the, the people who live across the road, whose family were in the División Azul, well, you know, they might not like um, terribly the fact that I'm writing on the on the international brigades. Um, you know, who they think of as a bunch of uh, communist rogues. Um, so that's uh, fascinating. Um, I have to say, once I got into it, it turned out to be um, uh, a massive project, really. Um, those archives that you talk about are not, are not actually new. My, my advantage in that was that they suddenly appeared online, and rather than having to go and sit in some cheap Moscow hotel for months and, uh, and beg for documents from someone, I was actually able to just um, uh, uh, you know, run around the the documents which are all on the internet. And I, my calculation would be there's probably, you know, if we go via pages, and Richard knows this archive well, probably about half a million uh, pages altogether. And then I went to archives in Warsaw, in Amsterdam, in London, in New York, in uh, Stamford, uh, around Spain as well. Um, so that's all been uh, fascinating, but of course, 
the other thing you have to do when you're writing about the international brigades is not understand what's going on in Spain. You have to understand what's going on in the 1930s in Europe, in the Americas, almost everywhere, because, because your international brigaders come from these uh, uh, 60 odd countries as they were then, if we count them now in terms of um, uh, uh, countries that were colonies or were part of larger entities like Yugoslavia, well, we've got probably more than 80. And they all have their own narratives from the 1930s. And these narratives drive uh, the individuals to Spain. And so you have a very complex web of, uh, of, of reasons for coming to Spain. And that web in itself actually paints for you uh, a picture of what the 1930s was about. Um, and, uh, and I found that very, uh, very satisfying, obviously also immensely hard work to, you know, you suddenly go, oh my God, what was happening in Poland or Hungary or, or you know, or Czechoslovakia? And, and, um, and the answer is very different things in very, in, a, in, uh, in the different places, but also, in the larger sense that we're in the sort of post, the post First World War meltdown, uh, in the sense that the, you know, the, the post World War One arrangements are beginning to fall apart uh, in many places, actually in uh, in Europe, and um, and Spain is sort of you know where it all kicks off um, uh, as we head into into World War Two. Um, so all that is fascinating. Uh, I'm also very interested in all the uh, sort of internal fighting, uh, the infighting in the brigade, which has been written about a lot, perhaps too much. Um, but even more than that, I think what I've tried to do is, a, is what I call a warts and all uh, study. In other words, I'm not interested in glossing over the bad stuff, and I don't think there's ever been an army of 35,000 people where there hasn't been quite a lot of bad stuff uh, going on, and that is all there in the book. Um, but at the same time, you know, I wanted to be there so that then the rest of it is believable, and the rest of it is sort of rather uh, remarkable. Uh, these 35,000 people that contemporary um, um, uh, observers, uh, the journalists, you know, looking for comparisons could only find uh, the Crusades as a sort of equivalent volunteer multinational transnational national army. Nowadays we'd point to Al-Qaeda perhaps or Daesh or other, or other uh, things that have emerged since then, but um, it was a very unique phenomenon and um, and the truth is there are 35,000 individual stories in there as well, which obviously one can't cover all of them by any means, but um, um, you know, it's a very uh, rich tapestry, shall we say. And um, so I've just tried to, you know, sew it all together. Thank you, Charles, as a, as a kick off the, uh, for the, the conversation. Um, Richard, um, you you have written, a, a, you know, among your books, you you have done a lot of research of yourself uh, in international brigades, and, and as I mentioned, uh, as part of your chairman of the trust, you've spent a lot of time with the brigadistas. Um, I mean, coming to Giles's book and what he's written, um, I mean, how would you sort of pick out what for you? Uh, it is sort of over old stuff, and but more positively, what would you say really stands out? Well, for, I was going to ask Giles exactly the same question. Um, <laughs> there is a huge historiography on the International Brigades that goes obviously right back to the war itself. Um, so there's been a lot of it tends to the material that most of the material that's been written for many years tended to be very binary. It was either very much taking one side or the other. And I think what Giles has picked up on well is that has been, there's been a temptation that's really been driven by the opening up of these 
archives in, Ma in, in Moscow, that there's been a more nuanced, more balanced approach to looking at the brigades, exactly as Giles was saying there, that it is about looking at them with a kind of warts and all approach. Because to see them, you know, to argue that everyone was a hero or that they were the Dukes of Moscow is to, is it's not, the story is not that simple. Um, and I think what Giles does well is that he brings in lots of portraits of individual figures who give you a sense of, uh, give you a sense and provide colour and give you an idea of what the people were actually like. And I think in many of the books that have been written up to, say, the 1990s, there tended to be a, a, a tendency for caricatures, caricatures, overly heroic literature, particularly before the fall of the wall. And I think, I think Giles is kind of continuing on that trend of, of having a more balanced approach. And for me, that's the most important thing to be able to, to look at them as objectively as possible. Obviously, we all have our own particular biases um, and those figure into the history. Um, I'm not saying that we don't, but I think actually, I think Giles does a fairly good job. I think, as you said earlier, of being objective. Um, Sir Paul, um, you with your extraordinary and unique and also unparalleled overview, um, but also detailed knowledge, um, bibliographical and, and historical and, and your own researches, I mean, looking at this book by Giles, which you've read, um, coming into it as, as a historian, um, picking up on Giles's sort of uh, putting down the gauntlet, you know, it's up to uh, historians to tell me whether I've done a good or bad job as a journalist. Um, he's still a journalist as far, as far as I'm concerned, just as I am, I and mean, we both write history, but we're journalists, we're journalists through and through. I've never come across more of a journalist than Giles, actually. Um, so how, how, what's, what's your thoughts about this book? Hang on, unmute yourself. Paul? This is your, your lot muted me. I don't know why, so anyway. <laughs> I mean, I, I don't, in a way, I think it's a sort of false um, contradict or contrast between, you know, a good journalist, is someone who, for me, is someone who writes the first draft of history. If it so, you, I would hope that what a journalist could bring to any historical work is readability. I think that's absolutely crucial. One hopes solid research, and it, as with all of Giles's books, the previous three, um, particularly, I mean, Goes to Spain, which I raved about, and I hope contributed to making it a bestseller. Um, you know, he does write beautifully and his research uh, is impeccable. As far as the International Brigades are concerned, uh, I mean, for me, this is kind of odd. I, I'm in an odd, a rather odd situation. Like I was at the, in at the very beginning of the creation of what became the International Brigade Memorial Trust. And I knew a lot of the British Brigaders and over the years have met Russians and, and, and you know, Mexicans and, and, and people from other, you know, for, for volunteers from other countries. But I'm in the weird situation that because I've spent 50 years studying the Spanish Civil War, I, all, I sometimes say it's, it's extraordinary. There are people who think that the international brigades are, are it, are what, what the Spanish Civil War is all about. And yet there are times when I feel the international brigades are a speck of sand on the beach that is the Spanish Civil War. And what, what's great about Giles's book, I think, is that you know, it justifies uh, the study of, of the International Brigades within the wider context of the study of, of the Civil War. One of the really important things about his book is that it is the overview, because what we had, what Richard was talking about, we previously had an awful lot an increasingly better um, national studies on the Americans, on the Canadians, on the French, et cetera, et cetera. But the only, um, the only overview was published 30 or 40 years ago by somebody called Andreu Castells, 
who was um, a functionary within, within the brigades. And it's a very useful, but very dry book. So in that sense alone, Giles's book is, is, is a, huge, a huge leap forward. The other thing is, I think that a lot of the memoir material, I mean, the, what I've just mentioned, they would, they, I'm talking really about scholarly books, but the, the huge amount of memoir material, while very often utterly fascinating and absorbing, has a defect, which is that they're memoirs not written by historians. So things like dates and places are often very, very vague. So they're great for atmosphere, you know, what it was like suddenly to be caught in a foxhole with some dangerous uh, Moorish mercenaries about to, to, to pile into the foxhole. They're brilliant for that, but there are very few that are based on diaries. And the ones that are based on diaries, are the ones that are, are really useful for the historian because you can kind of follow, follow the detail. The big gap, and I think something I was talking to Richard about earlier, and we've actually talked about a lot over the years. And this is really a really difficult issue. And I'd, I'd love to know what Giles thinks about this. The, or I get the impression from my reading that just although on the, on the other side, the Moorish mercenaries were of immense use to the Francoist, obviously as an instrument of terror um, and, and, and in many other ways. But the, the attitude of the Francoist high command was, these are scum, the dispensable uh, cannon fodder, you know, and, and they were very careless with the lives of these, of these mercenaries. And sometimes I get the impression that the, the attitude of the high command of the general staff of the Republican army wasn't that different in respect of the international brigades. There's a sort of feeling, you know, this is our war. Why do we need foreigners? Now, while the general populace was their morale was boosted no end by the fact that people from all over the world came to help them. I have suspicions about the attitude of, of the general staff. And what I never see, you know, there's this attitude, oh, well, you know, um, they, don't, they don't need rest periods out of the front line. Um, they could be paid peanuts, you know, they, they, they tell with them where food is concerned, you know, that, that they weren't treated all that well by their military superiors. Um, and I may be, may be completely wrong about that, but it is interesting that when one reads the, the memoirs of the senior military staff, the international brigades hardly get a look in. So I've been interested to see if, if Giles thinks I'm abs talking absolute rot or would he agree? Um, well, I think there are two things going on there, aren't there? One is, um, uh, whether they were badly treated, and the other is how important the Republican Army considered them to be. Um, I really don't think they were treated any worse than anybody else, actually. It's, you know, it's, the, it's almost the duty of every soldier to grumble about anyone who is above them in the chain of command. And, uh, you know, and the international brigaders were very good at it and, uh, and, and complained mightily uh, a, a lot of the time. But I'm sure that, you know, that the, that the Spaniard in the next trench along was almost certainly doing the, doing the same thing or even worrying about whether these foreigners had got better gear than us because where the hell did they get all that? And are the Russians, you know, making a special case out of them? I don't have any evidence of that. I'm just saying that it wouldn't surprise me at all if that, if that sort of thing was, uh, was going on. And then, of course, you know, within the brigades, everyone's complaining about every other nationality uh, or about other, other you know, political currents, and there's all sorts of other stuff going on. But I really do think that it's, you know, it's the lot of the, uh, of the soldier, um, you know, to, to basically win uh, 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 a lot of the time, you're bored, 
you know, 95% of the time you're not actually doing anything. And the other 5% of the time or 1% or 2%, you're terrified and you don't actually know an awful lot about what's going on. So when you were talking about the, uh, about the memoirs and the diaries, um, uh, I agree with you. The memoirs, most of them are sort of, you know, to be, you know, to be taken with uh, pinthas, as they would say around here. Um, but the diaries are great. On the other hand, sometimes they're written by people who really don't know an awful lot about what's going on. They just know what their tiny little section of the front looks like. So even now, I have arguments with the, with the Abraham Lincoln uh, battalion people who think that they attacked the Pingaron. Uh, and I don't think they did. I think, I think that was attacked by, um, um, by Spaniards and that, and that the Americans were simply part of a sort of diversionary attack, which was nearby. Um, and they were told they were attacking the Pingaron and said, okay, well, we're attacking the Pingaron. And then it went down in sort of, you know, in, uh, in, the, in the, um, the folklore of the, um, of the Americans that that's what they'd actually done. Um, uh, and I really don't think that they, that they had done. So in that case, that's another reason for being, you know, careful about what the actual brigaders themselves uh, say. Um, as for what the um, high command thought of them, well, that's very difficult. I mean, we obviously we have moments like in Madrid when um, some of the sort of common turn trained sort of natural propagandists are talking up clever. General Kleber as the um, as the savior of Madrid, and that uh, really really angers um, um, uh, especially Rojo, um, and then we get into a sort of really nasty sort of standoff between everyone and the and they mentioned this new term Kleberismo, which is sort of bigging yourself up basically. And, um, uh, and so you can see that there are tensions all the way through. Also in, in, uh, in Wesker, for example, when they're attacking Wesker, there are sort of people saying, well, actually, you know, the, the, the POM were, were a better lot than, the, than these international brigaders. Or uh, also, um, in fact, you know, on the attack on, uh, on, on Quinto, um, you also see some of the sort of general staff dissing the, the brigaders. Um, again, I don't think that's terribly surprising. I think they're probably doing the same to all the other, to all the other units. Um, but what the brigades are is that they are shock troops. They're shock troops and they're basically the foreign legion in the Republican army. In fact, their statute is pretty much a copy of the, of the, 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 the Foreign Legion or is based on the, on the ethos. And so I'm sure there will be preferred, there would have been some professional uh, uh, commanders in the Republican army who thought to them the same way that they would have thought of La Legion in Morocco or any other part of the army of Morocco um, um, or any other shock unit and you know their task was to be thrown into the hardest spots um, at the most difficult moments and and basically to if it was an, a, you know a, an enemy attack basically to be the first people to meet the um, the attackers head on and that's a very costly business in human lives it's also a very chaotic business because you turn up just as the whole thing's kicking off and nobody knows what's going on. And that's, we see that happening in, uh, in Harama where people just sort of walk over a hill thinking they're about to take part in some massive attack and realize that no, it's the other side that are attacking. And now, so we've got to start defending. Um, uh, in Guadalajara, you know, people don't seem to know at all what's going on. Uh, to begin with. At least of uh, all the Italians. And the Italians. Actually, <laughs> one of the nice things in, in uh, one of my sort of favourite finds in the book 
uh, you'll find that there's a photograph of a group of Italians who have been um, who have been captured, and I'm pretty sure from their from their tags on their uniform that they are the machine gun company that was captured right at the beginning and uh, whose captain basically gave away all the plans. Uh, and and that is how you know the the um, the republic actually discovered what was what was going on. Um, uh, there were only two um, uh, machine gun. Uh, I think it's a battalion actually. This there were only two machine gun battalions and uh, Italian ones. And the Italian army had very nicely put out a massive book uh, about the um, uh, about their volunteers, which you know allows you to get right down to identifying their 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 badges and um so you know this looks very much like um like that was them um but the other question which i know always comes up so i might as well answer it now is were they any good um and um and, and did they make a difference and i think the answer to that is that to begin with uh they weren't as bad as the rest which made them good, uh, that later on uh, they were as good as the rest. And, uh, but that as from Guadalajara onwards, um, you know, Guadalajara in a way is the last moment of, of glory in the sense of actually achieving something, um, uh, you know, something that alters the course of the war or has an impact on the course of the war. And after that, I think the rest of, much of the rest of the Republican army has actually come up to their, up to their level. Everybody was learning on the ground. Um, you know, the Republican army had to be uh, invented from scratch. Um, you know, we, one looks at the brigaders experience and, you know, the six shots that some of them have had uh, before they actually go into battle or the zero shots that others have have had and the complete lack of experience but again they're no different to the um, uh, to the to the Republicans and there's you know, a scene I describe uh, right at the beginning in Madrid um, where of some uh, a Spanish unit turning up and finding the international brigades there and going, you know, and these guys told us to hit the ground, so we hit the ground, and they seemed like experienced giants to us. Well, they'd only been there about twelve hours. Um, uh, you know, this was right, and they, and they were also having their first experience of war. Um, so, in that sense, and this is something I always have to sort of um, emphasise to Spanish audiences: they were Republican soldiers. They were simply part of the Republican army, rather than being, you know, Comintern's uh, secret secret force that was going to turn Spain into a into a into you know uh, the Soviet state. Um, so anyway, I hope that answers most of what you asked. Yeah, can I jump in as well? Because I, I mean, essentially, I I agree with both of you up to a point. I mean, I would say, Giles, that actually. They are used as shock troops slightly later than Guadalajara. I would say that Brunetta as well, they're still essentially seen as the Republicans, amongst the Republicans' best troops, along with perhaps the Communist 5th Regiment. But the reason that they're seen as the Republicans' best troops is because essentially at the start of the war, as you say, they are. They're used in that way, not because it's a kind of callous and careless throwing away of lives by the Republican high command. But, you know, the Republican high command has to build their army back from scratch. They're absolutely petrified that they have no idea which of their officers they can trust, which of their officers they can't trust. So they know that the international brigades who are conforming to this kind of Red Army tradition of discipline can at least be relied upon. So I think there is there is a kind of tendency to to see the way that they were treated as a yeah as an example of kind of that really callous approach to soldiers that you might see in the Second World War in Stalingrad. But it but it's it's not really like that. And I think the problem is because a lot of people are looking back and they see the discipline 
in Spain and judge it against a benchmark of the Second World War rather than the First World War, which is what they should really be doing. But then having said that, you know, General Patton wanted troops shot for shell shock in the Second World War. So attitudes were very, very different then. And I think there is a real tendency to see this notion of a Comintern army. Um, I mean, as you say, and it's, it, I just don't think that it's, it's that simple. Of course, there are commanders who are careless with the lives of their men. That's true of any army in any war, unfortunately. But to kind of extrapolate that out to make it this huge overarching theme, I think has been a consistent mistake of, of history and historians over the year. And I, yeah, I, which I, I think it's a, a bear trap, which you neatly avoid. Um, can I um, come in here? Because we're beginning to get some questions on chat and I, I'm keen on, on bringing in our, our attendees, our patient attendees. Um, I'm just going through some, some of the questions and do keep, keep throwing, throwing them into the chat. Um, um, David Hurst asks, what was their call to action message to make the international brigades leave their homes and fight and who ran the recruitment? Giles, can you be very succinct in that? Okay, well, I think we have to, we have to uh, think of two different phases. Um, uh, I like to talk about John Cornford, for example, and his group who turn up right at the beginning. They're the first British brigaders. They don't even know the international brigades exist because they didn't. But they don't, out. yeah. <laughs> they, they, they don't when they set out. They do when they get here, but not when they set out. And so to begin with, there's just a general uh, sort of call to arms across the left, uh, which actually the communist parties tend to uh, play down because they're very uh, disciplined and they don't want, you know, they they want everybody to go or nobody to go. Um, so to begin with, it's the sort of we can, you know, picture the romantic volunteers turning up uh, in a hundred different ways. Um, but then um, the com you know, the brigades are formed. The common turn is the basic structure of recruitment and logistics and so it's you know it is mostly the communist parties of different countries who are putting together uh, the you know the the recruiting structures uh, and often filtering people before they before they come uh, that's why Orwell couldn't join the brigades um, he didn't he didn't pass the filter um, and um, even though in fact you know when he got to uh, the famous events in, in in Barcelona that he describes actually why well, you know he's gone to Barcelona because partly because he wants to join the international brigades he's up with having a, a boring time in Aragon and he wants to and he wants to um, to join the brigades so his sort of change of of heart about what the communist sphere means and there's no doubt that the brigades are in the communist sphere within a very politicized army. Um, um, you know, his, his um, uh, conversion to skepticism, shall we say, uh, certainly, you know, genuinely, I think, happens in Barcelona because he really does want to join them. He admires them later on as well, but, um, but he wants to join them. So yeah, so recruitment is basically done by the Comintern. Uh, they have the people, they have the structures, they have the discipline, and, uh, and they have the international organization. Thank you, Giles. Um, Jonathan Stordy asks, um, Britain forgot its international troops following World War II, such as the Poles, considering the contemptuous attitude of Republican officials towards the brigades outlined by Sir Paul, what would have been the place of the brigadistas in Spain after a civil war won by the Republicans? Um, I'm gonna ask, Paul that? Well, <laughs> I don't believe in counterfactual history, of course. Um, and the usual, the usual counterfactual cliche, you know, is that if the Republic had won, then Spain would have become uh, rather like Poland or Czechoslovakia or Hungary after the Second World War, which is absolute tripe, of course. I mean, 
I happen to believe that, and it's a, it's a really, really difficult one, but in order to say, or to, to, to explain what might have happened had the Republic won the war, you have to explain what circumstances might have permitted the Republic to win the war. And that would have meant a completely different attitude by the great powers. In particular, it would have meant a completely different attitude on the part of the British. It would have meant that the policymakers in London acted in terms of national interest and not in terms of class prejudice, which was the basis of non-intervention. And it was non-intervention that stymied the, the Republic. Now, in fact, had the British uh, attitude been run by, or British policy been motivated by national interest and not class prejudice, then it is very likely, and I realize, having been tempted into the territory of counterfactual speculation, um, I'm going for it full on. I believe that the British would have woken up much earlier to the threat of Hitler. The idea that Hitler could be used as a, as a Rottweiler against the Soviet Union, I think you know, that, 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 that it wouldn't have gone like that. And if that had been the case, then in fact, not only would the Republic have won the Civil War, but there wouldn't have been a Second World War. So in that context, I can well imagine that the treatment of the brigaders would be exactly as Dolores Ibaruri suggested in her legendary speech, that they would be treated as honorary citizens. And in fact, the first time after the death of Franco that brigaders were allowed to go back into Spain, they were indeed greeted, greeted and hailed in exactly that way. I mean, they didn't actually formally get Spanish citizenship until many years later, but they were greeted with such warmth and love by, I mean, obviously Spain was then and still is a very divided society. And actually I want to take the opportunity, I wanted to ask Giles something, which was, you mentioned that your neighbor across the road would be apoplectic if you knew what you were doing and who you were writing about. I don't know if your book's been translated into Spanish yet, but obviously there are people in Madrid, friends and, and colleagues who know what you've been doing. What is your sense of the attitude of Spaniards today to the international brigades? Well, it's very divided. So yes, the book has been translated into Spanish. They, that was done really very quickly and, uh, and, uh, and it's done pretty well. It's in second, um, second edition. Um, so, I mean, I had hoped that my sort of even handed approach would sort of win over people who are interested in history for history's sake. Um, but of course there aren't very many of them around. <laughs> um, uh, most, you know, history is a massive battleground in, in Spain, as I'm sure you all know. And, uh, and, you know, the international brigades form part of that. One of the reasons they form part of that is that Franco liked to go on and on about them. Um, you know, he mentioned them continually in his speeches. Uh, if you look at the, you know, the inauguration of the Valle de los Caídos, for example, he's talking about, you know, how we, you know, rubbed the, you know, the, 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 the noses of those foreign Marxist hordes in the dirt. And that's almost a direct, uh, a direct quotation. Um, <clears throat> So there's still, um, there's still a difficult lot for Spaniards to digest. That said, um, it's been interesting to see some journalists on sort of what one would consider right wing newspapers, some reviewers giving, you know, giving it a pretty good review, others contacting me and saying, listen, you know, I really loved this book. I would love to have written about it, but my editor said no, uh, because it was the International Brigades. Um, uh, and then 
And then on the left, well, there's a sort of, there's a problem where, funnily enough, with the international brigades on the left, which is that everybody loves them, but nobody actually really knows anything about them. And so that sort of also leads people down different roads of incomprehension or simply not really uh, understanding what was going on. Um, and so, you know, for example, uh, I mean, the, all the Podemos leaders love the international brigades. In fact, I had the bizarre experience or interesting experience the other day of being interviewed by the deputy prime minister on his on his own TV show or his own uh, Podemos web show uh, just about this book because he was because he's fascinated by uh, uh, by the international brigades. I'm talking about um, Pablo Iglesias, of course. Um, uh, but again, you know, I've I've noticed, you know, that there's a um, um, and I'm not talking about Iglesias, but others who are sort of they just don't really understand what was what was going on. Um, but it's also interesting that for some people who are very who are actually genuinely interested in the in the history of the Spanish Civil War and then start reading about the international brigades, it's when they sort of realize that actually within the left, within the Republic, the communists were the responsible guys. They weren't the, the wacky extremists. Um, they weren't the people who were, who were you know, madly setting up um, or carrying out the, the counter-revolution and collectivizing and and uh, 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 and and the like. In many ways, they were the more responsible, uh, organized part, possibly even more so than the sort of Largo Caballero wing of the um, of the Socialist Party. That's how I read it. I know, Paul. What do you think? Is that a a decent reading? Well. Obviously, <laughs> in terms of what you've just said, it reminds the business about the the journalist who got in touch with you and said, loved your book, couldn't do it. Rather reminded me when I did my biography of Santiago Carrillo. I a lot of the reviews from people on the left were saying, yeah, Carrillo's a national treasure. How dare he be criticized in this way? And the same people getting in touch with me privately and saying, Thank God, finally, someone's nailed the bastard. <laughs> um, but anyway, the, it is, I mean, the problem about my, my impression, I mean, over the years is everybody's got an opinion about the Spanish Civil War, but it's usually based on monumental ignorance. And that really is a problem when you, you know, over, over the, the number of people you have an intelligent conversation with about the Spanish Civil War. I'm not going to lose the whole audience now. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, it's, Paul, Paul can, I, can I just cut you off there? Because there, there are quite a few people who are getting absolutely inundated with questions, and I'm just quite keen on at least addressing some of them. Um, although I would strongly dispute what you've just said, as you know I would, because uh, the, the reason people feel very strongly about the Spanish Civil War is that most Spaniards... Uh, have relatives who died on one side or the other. Um, it's got nothing to do with ignorance. It's it's to do with personal human. I, I wasn't talking about. I wasn't talking about Spaniards. I was talking no. about. Um, anyway. Okay. We could talk um, about another day. We can have an all uh, another, another, another day. We'll we'll get back to that one. But there are two there are two sort of interesting or various interesting ones. But uh, one for Alejandro Batista Tejada, which in a sense has been touched on before. I think Paul, you you referred to it and. Uh, all three of you in passing, but it's to do with the uh, w when you've got this sort of huge subject and you're dealing with all sorts of things from archives through to mem memorials to diaries. Um, you are confronted by, among others, by first-hand testimonies, uh, especially told by Americans. And here were, you know, Giles, in your book, you're pretty visceral and probably quite right about Hemingway and Martha Gellhorn. Um, could you very briefly um, sort of up some, um, because I mean, you know, Gellhorn didn't believe in anything like journalistic objectivity. I mean, she said so, she's got, you, you quote her in a wonderful way. And Hemingway spent writing very good novels, um, pretending that the, um, you know, for whom the bell tolls was uh, 
uh, had a, a true Abraham Lincoln guy, uh, and the Abraham Lincoln people said it was a load of toss, you know. But you're, you're very good on, on in that particular chapter. Could could you uh, just up some that? Yeah, yes, Jamie. But um, the question from the um, the original question, what was it exactly? From were well, our first-hand testimonies, especially told by Americans, not to be trusted? Um, okay, so first-hand testimonies are to be trusted in in the very small scale sense that person A experienced these events. Um, whether person A is then capable of, of describing that factually in terms of geography um, uh, and, uh, and the rest of it, it then becomes more, more difficult and really you need, you, know, you need two sources on anything before you can really be uh, be sure, and you know, no, and certainly not a memoir that's written forty years after the event, which many of many memoirs were written, you know, decades afterwards. Um, uh, no, I mean the number of sightings of Tito, Marshal Tito from Yugoslavia. You know, I've come across about three or four sightings of him, but he was never in Spain. But these are people in their memoirs, you know, saying that they've seen the same that they've met him. So, so um, you know, you have to be very, very careful. I sort of, you know, when I think of 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 what in in of what that means in terms of of the work, I sort of think of it as you know, building a a sandcastle out of grains of sand, where you know you really do have to, you know, just take very tiny bits and and put them all together before you can build a picture, or perhaps um, you know, quantilisma in you know all these little dots, all the little facts, and then you paint your picture with the, with the facts. Of course, everybody could rearrange those dots and paint a, a different picture, but you know, that's, that's what you've got. I've got two, two uh, questions which are, are related, and it goes back to the issue of when the literary imagination uh, and cinematic uh, imagination uh, encroaches on, on, on history and to what extent it, it, it's an accurate reflection or, or not. Um, Mark Penfold um, asks, what is your view of, of how the international brigades have been portrayed in recent historical fiction? I'm thinking particularly of the Farco series of novels by Arturo Pérez Reverte. Uh, and related to that, Mercedes Porcel Martín, uh, on, on the film front, uh, obviously refers to Ken Loach's film Land of Freedom, which I'm sure lots of you have seen. Uh, to, to what extent does that portray the IB historically and accurately? Um, I mean, Richard, do come in there if you like. Yeah, sure. Well, let's let's start with Ken Loach. Um, I mean, he did obviously he didn't write the screenplay. That was Jim Allen. Um, I would say, well, in fact, I know because I spoke to him recently that his attitude towards the film now is slightly different to what it was when it came out. His judgment about the international brigades now is is slightly less critical, although he still, you know, he still essentially sticks to the same line that he always does, always has done in terms of the revolution, whether to carry the revolution forward or whether you need to just prosecute the war and, and have the, the revolution later that Orwell goes in, into in his book. Um, he's now changed slightly. I mean, he's always been, to be fair to him, he's always been quite supportive to the brigades, uh, but he is now, he has now, Come much more so, um, because I, I mean, I don't think there's anybody that's seen that film that knows about the international brigades and knows the story that that doesn't know that in fact that the ending is not is not accurate. It's true. I mean, we we all accept that within a film, it's cinematic, and you allow a certain license. The problem the problem with Land and Freedom, in a way, is is really related is related. It all comes back to Warwell in that everybody tends to see Land and Freedom as a kind of cinematic version of Homage to Catalonia. And, it, and it's not, it's not that. It is, it is a film and it needs to be seen as a film. Um, and films are always gonna be problematic if you expect them to be accurate portrayals of history. That's not, that's not what their job is. If you want that, you read a book, you go to a documentary. If you, if you want an accurate portrayal of history, 
you're not going to get it from a film. You have, you know, we're talking about how you have to view sources really, really carefully. You have to sift through and balance and and decide which you use. You know, if you're looking, if you're trying to do that with a film, it's it, you know, it, it's a it's a mugs game to be honest. Um, Giles, what about you? Know, the point about Arturo Pereira Reverte. I mean, you know, his his series of novels. I mean. Or, or generally historical fiction in, in Spain um, in the last sort of, say, 10 or 15 years. Um, I mean, do, do you think uh, it accurately reflects what's going on or, or we, do we fall into the sort of binary um, debate that you've, you've referred to before and Paul was referring to before? Uh, Jimmy, I'm going to pass on that question. I don't think I've read enough of the, of the books you're, um, you're do, talking about. Any of your, any of the panellists want to... Paul, on, on literature, Paul? Yeah, I mean, overall, I do not like fictional accounts of the Spanish Civil War, uh, particularly the ones that bring in real politicians, real people, because I find when I'm reading them, I'm kind of tearing my hair out saying, oh, my God, Ned Green would never have said that, or Athania would never have said that. So I, 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 I do find them... Um, rather problematic. As far as Hemingway's concerned, <laughs> many years ago, I mean, many, many years ago, uh, I ran a seminar at which I brought the last surviving uh, commander of the British Battalion, Bill Alexander, together with the last surviving commander of the Abraham Lincoln Battalion, Milt Wolfe. It was not a happy meeting. Um, <laughs> it, it, they ignored it, each other, I seem to remember. Yes, but what was interesting, at one point, someone, I can't remember who it was, said, asked uh, Milt what he thought about Hemingway. Um, and he just sneered and said, it took him quite a long time to say these two words. He just sort of said, fucking tourist. Which, in many respects, rather, you know, um, <laughs> Hemingway is rather complicated. Personally, I happen to have a very high opinion of Martha Gellhorn um, from the work I did when I wrote about the correspondence um, in Spain. Uh, I, I came away having a lot of time for Martha Gellhorn, who I met very briefly again at an international brigade meeting. Um, in the 80s, I think it was, and I just thought she was wonderful. Um, and yet it's interesting. Um, there's a lot of material that I didn't use or I couldn't use in my book about the correspondence. And the snide remarks about Martha Gellhorn from other women who were involved are quite remarkable, but I think they were more to do with uh, she had long legs and they didn't. Mm -hmm. um, there's so much more that we could discuss, but we're, we're, we're now um, at, at over 10 minutes and um, I'm going to wind up quite soon. Um, I think, um, Giles, I'd like to sort of um, let you en end up really. Um, just picking up on, on uh, and, and uh, I think there's, there's still two or three outstanding questions, which um, I just don't think we're going to have time for unless we went on for another 10 minutes. Bundle them, up? Huh? Bundle them up in one, and I'll try and answer them as I sum up. Um, yeah, I mean, I'm, I'm basically reading through them and trying to get a sort of a, a, an up someone. Um, and I think probably um, it, it, it bats back into something that, that Paul said, uh, which is that the, the enduring debate, really. Um, you know, the international brigades, what was it a speck in the sand or not? Um, because I have to say, you know, my, my, it's not a criticism, but, you know, when, you've, when you finish reading a book this size, um, you know, you end up sort of wondering, you know, all right, you have a lot of mores, uh, as, as Paul was referring to, you know, the mercenaries leading the charge on their, on their Moorish mares and getting into the trenches and things. There's quite a lot of that. Um, uh, but you don't really get any sense of the humanity of the other side um, at any stage. Um, and war is, is a pretty bloody business on both sides. I'm just wondering whether uh, you ever thought, you know, 
over the six years you were doing this and when you finished your work, um, di did you feel that there was another side to the story which you'd like to write about? Um, not especially, to tell you the truth. I mean, it's, it's very, there are a few testimonies from, um, and, I was, and I certainly, you know, looked out for any, any evidence that I could find of the other side talking about the International Brigade. And, um, and in fact, there's a very heroic episode uh, where some, um, I think, Canary Island captain basically stops the 15th and 13th brigades getting up the hill at, uh, at Brunette uh, with just a handful of sort of typists and, uh, and, and drivers who've been kind of rushed to the rush to the front and that's and that's very interesting um but you know once you've done a war you don't really want to go back and <laughs> I, in my for, for me I don't really want to go back and and do it again from a from a from a different perspective um, um you know being sort of uh, I, I feel as though I spent quite a lot of time not not in the trenches but with people who've been in the trenches if you know what I mean that's quite after a while it gets to be quite um quite taxing. So uh, is there another side to the Spanish Civil War? Of course. Um, um, if I was going to suggest another book on volunteers fighting somewhere from Spain, there's actually an incredibly good book on the División Azul, if every, anybody ever wants to mm -hmm. read it. It's, it's really exceedingly well written and very, and very, and very fascinating. Um, so, in, you know, in that sense, I'm interested, but not to the extent of wanting to write about it myself. Thank you very much. I mean, just hand on heart, just to finish off, hand on heart. Um, would you say this, this plays to what you felt at the end of writing this book? The International Brigade is in some sense fighting for all of us, a thin line of suffering and often ill-armed human beings standing between barbarism and at least comparative decency. Uh, yes, yes, I would. Uh, the International Brigades, to me, uh, um, signify the, the people who could see what was coming or, or at least were prepared to uh, risk their lives uh, to prevent what eventually was going to become World War II. I mean, I'm simplifying exceedingly. Um, but, uh, you know, as Paul said, if they'd won, maybe we would we would have had World War II. And, uh, and, and in fact, you know, my thesis about the brigaders themselves is that they did win. They just lost in Spain. They won at the end of, the, at the end of World War II because above all what they were was anti-fascists. And, uh, and those who made it to the end of World War II could certainly say that everywhere except, unfortunately, in Spain, that, that they'd, managed to, they'd managed to do that. Um, so yes, that is not that is not to say that they were all saints, or the or that the motivation of every individual who was there was, um, you know, to uh, protect blessed liberal democracy. Um, that's not true. Um, but it's also certainly true that at the time when they were fighting, uh, the um, you know the political apparatus of uh, the United Kingdom of France of the United States were all appeasing Hitler and Mussolini. Appeasement started in Spain, that's what non-intervention was. Spain is where Hitler and Mussolini learned that they could get away with a whole load, load of things. And, um, and so there's something uh, honorable in that sense uh, to doing that. And we mustn't forget also that actually quite a few people were uh, were um, in favor of Hitler in Britain and in other places, and that they only actually became anti-fascists uh, five months after the Spanish Civil War ended and Hitler invaded Poland. Um, and that the Brigaders are themselves, the, in that sense, the original anti-fascists before um, you know, our fathers or grandfathers uh, suddenly were all anti-fascists as well. Uh, if we'd asked them a few months earlier or a year earlier or two years earlier, um, you know, the answers would have been quite different. And we mustn't be 
uh, and this sort of this wondrous, glorious British history that we tell ourselves, uh, we mustn't fool ourselves into thinking that um, Britain was always a 100% anti-fascist country because it simply wasn't. Um, I think that's a good point to to end on, and and um, I I don't have to sort of uh, remind Richard or, or Paul or, or or Giles about this, but for those of you who don't know about it, there's there's a sort of moving uh, memorial to the International Brigades uh, on near the South Bank, which which uh, I recommend you going to see. So um, and and you might go there and reflect on uh, on Giles's. Uh, and, and the, the, the sort of excellent discussion we've had today. Um, as I said, um, tomorrow we'll send you details about this book. I mean, I, I really sort of suggest you go for it. Um, I also suggest you on, on a totally different subject that you come to our webinar on March the 2nd, next Tuesday, uh, Phil Stevens and uh, Ignacio Torreranca on um, uh, Suez to Brexit, uh, Global Britain. Um, God forbid. Anyway, on that note, thank you very much, all of you. Uh, and um, uh, congratulations, Giles, from Simon Manley, former British ambassador in uh, Madrid, who you knew, know well, um, really like your talk. And in fact, I can see uh, you, you've, you've made a real hit. So thank you, all three of you, um, for this really, really good discussion. Thanks very much. Thanks to all of you for, um, for joining us. And thanks especially to Richard and, and Paul. Nice to see everybody. Have a nice evening. Thank you, Bye. Justin, for hosting it. Thanks. Thanks, mate.